Thank you everyone for coming here today. Um, as mentioned, my name is Lauren Hutausen and I'm a hydrogeologist with Juna. Um, before we get too far into it, I'd just like to recognise and pay my respects to the Ghana people whose land we're on today. Um, and also recognise and pay my respects to the Adyamapna people whose uh, land we were welcomed onto and where we conducted our assessment um, of Hukuna Spring uh, up on their land. Um, so we'll just go with a big picture, a really broad um, understanding. So water is a really key component to um, Aboriginal culture across many different communities across the entire country. Um, it's a real focal point in a lot of dreaming stories and um, I guess a few of the really prominent, well-known ones are um, Titalik the Frog. Um, I chose that picture because that was one of my favourite books when I was a kid and I just saw that picture and it reminded me of my childhood reading that book. Um, so he taught us not to be greedy with our water and that we should be um, sharing it with the community and the people that we live with. Um, and another example is the rainbow serpent who is associated with creation and who um, created formations such as lakes and rivers and waterholes. And uh, the rainbow serpent can be seen moving between waterholes um, after big rain events and um, a really prominent uh, Aboriginal dreaming story there. Uh, in a more focused sort of uh, zoning in on the Adyamapna community, um, water is really significant, particularly at Hukuna Springs, um, first and foremost because it's a sacred women's site. Um, it's also the only registered songline in South Australia. Um, and so I guess those two main points are just the real sort of uh, important point in why it's such a significant thing to the community. From a more scientific aspect, um, it's got very unique ecology, hydrology, archaeology, and um, I just like to bunch them all together and just call it the ologies. So unique ologies, really. Uh, so the, the community actually has quite um, big concerns that there are certain activities such as uh, livestock grazing, uh, groundwater extraction for irrigation use, uh, and tourism, as well as a myriad of other things that could be uh, causing damage to Hookiness Spring um, and really impacting on such a key cultural aspect uh, for them. And so um, Mel actually did a bit of ecology work up with the community and uh, after seeing, seeing what she did up there, she suggested that we come in and provide a hydrogeological assessment of the area. So we came in and we didn't really know too much about the area, so we just wanted to get a real overall understanding of what was happening up there. So the first thing that we'd like to know about the area was just basically how the spring and the creek system worked, um, understanding the hydrology and the hydrogeology of the area. Um, we also wanted to provide an age date of the groundwater to understand whether the water was coming from somewhere nearby Hukuna Springs or somewhere much further away. Um, and from that, we could then identify what kind of potential risks there were to the system uh, and whether some of these uh, things are what we need to really take into consideration. So just to uh, give an idea of where we're working with, uh, Hukuna Spring is located a couple hundred kilometres north of Adelaide, just at the very base of the Ikara Flinders Ranges. If we zoom in to where I was just showing, um, Hukuna Spring is located just in here. Uh, and some nearby uh, features are the township of Hawker. Uh, and this cool little bit here, um, it's not so little, but it's actually uh, Wilpina Pound right there. So quite close to some interesting features of the landscape there. Uh, so now that we know what it looks like from above, this is what it looks like from the ground. Um, you can see that right in the distance, we've got um, the Yafala and Elder Ranges. Um, somewhere, sort of, I guess, down in there uh, is Wilpina Pound. In your immediate foreground, you've got these flat, barren plains. Um, you've got a few sort of low-lying shrubs in the middle there, but sort of in this area, you've got flat plains. It was really interesting, we had some archaeologists out there in the field with us on the day and you'd be walking along these plains and I felt like I was walking on eggshells because they go, oh, look at that artefact there and look at that artefact there, don't step on that. And so it was really interesting to see just how culturally rich this area was, um, even in you know, somewhere that you can't really see it there, but it's there. Um, this pano doesn't really quite show it, but Hook in a Spring is actually sort of off 
to the side, around there. And so the first aim of understanding the general creek and spring system, um, I'll just explain it to you. It's better than bombarding you with lots of words. So this is Hook in a Creek here. You can see it's sort of slightly sunken down. There's a bit of erosion that's occurred. Um, and the area is actually um, prone to flash flooding every couple of years or so. Um, what's interesting to note is that Hook in a Spring doesn't really have a direct point source, uh, unlike many springs up in the Saal or um, Gab region. Um, there's lots of cracks and fractures in, in the um, geology in the area and uh, the underlying groundwater sort of flows up through these cracks and just sort of gradually saturates the area until you um, build it up and you get to this real um, creek system. This is a picture of the main site here. Um, so you've got these really interesting sort of like bits of rock here just jutting out of the water. And so that's a um, conglomerate rock. So it's a really hard impermeable rock sticking out and it also underlies the water. So it's this uh, formation of conglomerate rock that runs the entire um, creek uh, length. Um, and it sort of dissipates and breaks up and uh, it, it shows this underlying uh, sandy sediments. And so the water flows along across this conglomerate rock and then once it dissipates and it reaches these sandy sediments, it kind of just sinks straight back down into the groundwater system. So this is just a close-up of the conglomerate rock that you've got here. So the conglomerate is kind of like a whole series of tiny little rocks that have all been cemented together. And here's a nice photo of um, all the fractures that you can see. So there's sort of bits of plants and stuff that are growing in all these cracks. Um, and so that's where all the water is sort of flowing up um, into the creek system. Oh, we'll skip that one. I don't think I've got time to show that one. Um, so just a really basic way of uh, explaining how it works is that um, if you're a clumsy person like me, you might uh, have your glass of water sitting on your bench and you've spilt it across the bench. And so the water is flowing across the bench and uh, you're in a bit of a panic. <laughs> But this one you shouldn't be panicking. Um, so the hard, hard surface is acting as the conglomerate that, you're seeing, that we were seeing at, at the site. Obviously the water is your creek water. Um, and then if you're a quick thinker, you might grab a sponge and stick it at the end of the bench. Um, and so the sponge is acting as the sandy sediments which are just soaking up the water as it um, re-enters back into the groundwater system. So that's just a real rough bare bones way of explain, explaining what's happening at Hookner Creek. So now that we've got an idea of what's happening at the creek system, we can start to sort of get into um, understanding a little bit more complex things that are happening there. So this is my little attempt at making a bit of a joke here. So um, when you talk about groundwater age dating, it's not like a typical sort of date like this. Um, we actually want to date the groundwater to understand um, how long it's actually been in the subsurface for. So whether it's been in there for a short amount of time or whether it's been in there a long amount of time uh, can help us determine how far the water has travelled before it's reached the surface. So uh, a better way of explaining it is using this cool little diagram here. So imagine you've got your hook in a site here. Um, now if we manage to date our groundwater to be quite young, so a few years or a few decades, um, you would expect that the water would uh, infiltrate into the groundwater system or recharge uh, sort of around about here, and then it would resurface at Hookener site quite close. Um, but the water that we were sampling at Hookener was dated to be between uh, 1,700 to 3,000 years old. So it's more kind of um, in this region um, at a higher gradient, um, sort of between like millennia and centuries that it's recharging into the groundwater. So it's traveling down, sort of sitting in the groundwater, uh, just doing its thing for a few thousand years. And then, as I previously mentioned, the fractures that are occurring um, in this area, they're sort of acting as a pathway or a conduit. So once the water reaches these fractures, it actually flows up and it um, reaches the surface at hook and a side. Um, so from the ground, what you can say is that um, if it's occurring farther away and it's occurring at a high gradient, um, we suggest that it's a process called mountain block recharge. And so, um, what you can say is that the molecules of water that we were sampling um, and testing at Hook and a site, um, their little groundwater adventure started all the way up here in the ranges. So quite a distance that they've travelled over the last few thousand years. 
So now that we know um, that it's not really a, a local uh, source of the groundwater, that it's more regional, and it's, um, you can start to realise that it's, it's not such a small scale kind of thing. We've got to really um, expand and sort of think more in terms of um, larger areas, further distances away. Um, and to explain that if we had activities such as our livestock grazing or our tourism that were occurring in this area, we wouldn't really expect to see the effects of that happening for a few thousand years. Um, and that could be you know, happening right now um, and we aren't going to see it, probably not in our lifetime. Um, so this is something that we haven't really looked that far into just yet, um, possibly something that we could take on in the future, um, identifying what kind of things we're doing in these areas further away and whether they could be impacting Hukuna in the future. Um, so that's something that we could be investigating further um, in future. Um, so this study was really important um, because uh, behind the scenes of all this, we did a lot of collaboration with the Aboriginal community, community up in the Flinders Ranges and um, there was a real sort of, we shared our science and our knowledge um, and in return they shared a lot of their knowledge with us. And so um, it was a really important um, study for us to undertake as we learnt just as much as they did um, by sharing our knowledge. Uh, it's also really important because preserving the land is also uh, preserving the culture of uh, the communities up there. And so it's really important that we uh, make sure that we take the right actions and the right steps to help preserve this. Uh, and from a scientific aspect, it's also really important that we preserve the ologies as well. Um, I'll just leave you with uh, my final sort of take home note in that um, what I found from working with the community here is that uh, the Aboriginal cultural knowledge is a really untapped um, resource uh, for the science world and I think that there's a lot that we can learn from the communities and that they can learn from us and I think that's something that we should really uh, start looking into and it's something that Mel's mentioned and something that's been mentioned um, yesterday as well and um, yeah, so something that we should keep in mind. Uh, and if you'd like to look further, you can get a copy of our assessment here or um, feel free to send me an email and I'll reply to you as soon as I can. So, thank you. Cheers.